If you've ever looked at buying an Apple product recently, you've probably seen things like M3 Max or A17 Pro. These are custom chips called Apple Silicon that powers Apple's devices. But to be frank, the naming of these chips don't really convey much, and for most consumers, it can get really confusing. For example, is M3 better than M2? Is it better than M2 Pro? What about M2 Max? And how many cores do you really need? What's with this unified memory? In today's video, I'm going to demystify the entire Apple Silicon lineup and explain how this all works. I'm going to give you a simple, easy to understand framework on how to decipher Apple's chips, how core counts are relevant to you, and ultimately, what chip should you personally get? So let's get started. Let's start with the basics. Apple has two main classes of chips found in the majority of their products. You've got the A series of chips, which are found in the iPhones and some iPads, and you've got the M series of chips, which are found in some iPads and all Macs. Both chips are built using the same foundation, the same basic core designs. The A series of chips are the most basic and are optimized for mobile phones and tablets, which means they don't require any cooling. Each year, Apple comes out with a slightly improved, more powerful version, so you can always just assume the chip with the highest number attached to it will always be the best. But for some reason in 2023, they decided to attach the word Pro to the A17 chip, which hints that things may get more complicated in the future, and knowing Apple, they love to make things overly complicated, but for now, things are pretty straightforward. Let's move over to the M series. These chips are more robust and were specifically made for Macs, hence why they used the letter M. However, eventually Apple needed a way to boost their iPad Pro, so they stuck some M series chips in those as well just to make things extra confusing. But for the M series chips, there are four different variants. At the start, we got M1, which then progressed into the M1 Pro, M1 Max, and finally the M1 Ultra. All of these chips were built using the same basic foundation using the five nanometer process. Comparing chips within a generation is easy and straightforward. So within a generation, each chip in the sequence is better than the chip before it. Usually all Apple is doing here is adding more cores, which means the chip is capable of processing more stuff at the same time. However, just looking at the number of cores a chip has doesn't always show how powerful a chip is. More on that later. So that was chip generations. Now let's talk about chip classes. Though the M1 Pro is technically better than the M1 chip, the true successor to the M1 chip is actually the M2 chip. The best way to think of this is that each chip is in a specific class. So the M1, M2, and now M3 all belong to what I'll refer to as the baseline class. Whereas the M1 Max, M2 Max, and M3 Max would be part of the Max class of chips. Just how it's easy to compare within each generation of chips, it's also easy to compare between each specific class. For example, you can bet that the M3 is better than the M2 and M2 is better than M1. But where things start to get confusing is when you compare chips from different generations and different classes. Like, how does the M3 baseline chip compare to the M2 Pro chip? This is where benchmarks really come into play and why tech nerds like myself spend hours geeking out about various tests. But to make things simple, we're going to focus on two key areas of these chips. The CPU, which handles all of the main processing, and the GPU, which handles anything graphics related. Each generation, Apple creates new CPU and GPU cores. The key thing to remember here is every chip within a generation uses the same basic core design. The only major difference between say an M1 chip and an M1 Ultra is that the M1 Ultra has more CPU and GPU cores. The cores themselves though are not any faster or better, there's just more of them. So think of it like building a house. The M1 chip is like having eight people working on a house. 
whereas the M1 Ultra chip is like having 20 people working on a house. The people themselves are not any faster, but since there are more of them, ultimately the house gets built faster. With computing, this is called parallel processing, where your computer can process multiple things at once. Many programs today can take advantage of this, but just so you know, there are often limits to this as well. For example, hypothetically, if we suddenly had 10,000 people working on our house, there's just not enough to do, so most of those people are just going to be sitting around doing nothing. Why this is important for you is while a 20-core CPU on paper may sound better than an 8-core CPU, it really depends on the type of work you are doing because you may not need all of those cores. Now, let's go back to our house analogy when we had eight people. What if instead of adding more people, we can just make them more powerful? This is what Apple does when they release a new generation of chips, like when we go from M1 to M2. With the M2 generation, you could have the same exact number of cores on a chip, but those cores are now more powerful compared to M1. This means that on paper, core for core, an M2 is better than M1. Keep in mind, Apple's chips actually have two different types of CPU cores, less powerful efficient cores and high power performance cores. Apple will usually market the total number of cores on a chip, but you may want to check out how many performance cores a chip has as those will be handling the more demanding tasks. This is why just looking at the total number of cores doesn't always tell you the whole story. You also need to look at the chip generation as well. So this is the basic framework for how you understand which chip is actually better. You look at both the chip generation as well as the number of cores the chip has. One quick side note I should add here, with the M1 Pro and Max chips, they actually shared the same number of CPU cores. The only major difference between them was that the Max chips had twice the number of GPU cores. This was the same with M2 Pro and M2 Max as well. With the M3 generation, Apple changed this, and now the M3 Pro and M3 Max actually have completely different core counts, so we can firmly place them in their own class of chip. While it does make things temporarily confusing, I actually think going forward it makes it more clear, as each chip within a generation gets better and better, going from the baseline chip all the way up to the highest end chip. So that's all great, but what does this mean for you? The good news is essentially every program you run is going to utilize the CPU. So the first thing you want to do is make sure whatever Mac you buy has the CPU power you need. The other good news is that these chips are so good that even the baseline M1 chip has a pretty powerful CPU. For everyday tasks like emails, word processing, web browsing, video calls, and all of those things, the M1 is more than powerful enough for those tasks. So this means if you find a Mac with either M1, M2, or M3, you can bet it can handle all of that flawlessly. Now, if you do things like video editing, audio production, software development, data analysis, these tasks will likely demand more from your CPU. So my suggestion here is to try and look for a higher end CPU, like the pro or max level of chips. Of course, an ultra would be great too, but just may be overkill for some of you. On the GPU side of things, this is where Apple Silicon slips a little bit. Again, if you just do basic tasks, the GPU on an M1 is more than fine, but things can change quickly. For video editing, 3D modeling, animation, graphic design, photography, gaming development, if you use CAD software, or you do scientific simulations, you're really going to need a more powerful GPU in addition to a powerful CPU. Here is where I would look for the best CPU and GPU combination like a Max or an Ultra chip. If you do these things more as a hobby though, you definitely could get away with something in the middle, like say a pro level of chip. Now, let's talk about memory for a second. Traditional computers have essentially two types of memory, regular RAM and VRAM. These would be separate modules, one connected to your GPU and one connected to your CPU. All you really need to understand here is that this model, according to Apple, is highly inefficient. What Apple has done is combined all of this onto one chip, meaning instead of having RAM for the CPU and VRAM for the GPU, you just have one type of RAM for everything on the chip. 
In some ways, this is much better. However, one thing you may hear on the internet and even from Apple themselves is that because of this new fancy memory system, some people claim you don't need as much memory anymore. But truthfully, with maybe a few exceptions, this is just plain wrong. I could honestly spend an entire video going deep into why that is, and maybe I will later, but just know that generally speaking, the amount of RAM you need on an Intel computer is roughly the same on Apple Silicon. Finally, I do want to touch on the other elements on these chips. There are things like the Media Engine and Neural Engine. These are nice to have features, but with some slight variance among the chips, all Apple Silicon chips actually have these on them. If you're a video editor, you could take a peek at the Media Engine specs, but the reason why I'm not really diving too deep into that right now is because I think the focus here is really on the CPU and the GPU more than anything else. You're not exactly going to buy a chip just for the Media Engine. So while Apple's chip lineup can be a bit confusing, once you understand the basic framework of chip classes and chip generations, you can at least navigate the ever-growing and changing Apple Silicon landscape without too much confusion. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.